Right, welcome, uh, welcome back to the uh, Department of Biology. Um, it's um, it's great that you've made the time to uh, to come and visit us today. Um, what we're going to do is I've got, I'm going to I'm going to say a little a few words about the department. So I'll talk for a few minutes and then and then uh, David Kent, who's um, uh, recent acquisition to York uh, and is but is already the um, uh, uh, the chair of the departmental uh, research committee and deputy head of department for research he's going to he's going to give a research talk and then um, we'll look forward to having a chat uh, towards the end of the hour and um, so please if, you, if you've got any any questions or any comments you want to make just pop them in the uh, in the chat um, and and we can go through some of those when we get towards the end of the session. And if you want to ask a question at the end, then uh, then then um, uh, make yourself known and say something, and that'll be fine. So so this is me. I'm uh, I'm James Moyer. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I've been head of department since the beginning of 2020. Uh, and um, so this and this is a kind of order of events for uh, for the session today. So this is a uh, this is a, a view of the department from the uh, west side. So this is the new biology teaching block, which has been in operation for three or four years. Um, it's uh, it's not been in operation as much as we'd like it to be in the last uh, year and a half, though, of course. And um, and it's so it's it's uh, what I'd like to start with is to talk you through a little bit about how things have been over the last. Uh, Last fifteen to eighteen months with the, uh, the 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 strange world we now live in, um, we have managed. What the, the for those of you who haven't been to uh, to York for for a while, this this building now contains the teaching labs uh, for all of the uh, for all of the undergraduate uh, and and postgraduate taught students, and uh, we have been able to continue doing some practical work through some of the periods of the uh, of, of the various lockdowns that we've had since March 2020. And um, so we've tried very hard to make sure that, that the uh, current students have still had some practical experience. But most of the rest of the teaching, all the lectures and workshops and most of the tutorials have been delivered in this same sort of format that we're working on here. So online on Zoom. Um, as we as we get into the, the summer here now, we're, we're, we're kind of approaching a, a, a return to normality. So whilst the students haven't been around, they've, they've, uh, we had an event for, for the graduating cohort last week, which was extremely nice to see, uh, see the students who've, uh, who've completed their, their, uh, their, their degrees under such strange circumstances. Um, and, and we look forward to next academic year being a little bit more like normal, where we're expecting or anticipating or hoping that, uh, that we'll be able to uh, be back in rooms and, uh, and seeing, seeing uh, one another on a more regular basis. It's been, it's been a, you know, an extraordinary time to be, take over being head of department. I thought it was going to be a challenge when I took over at the beginning of 2020, uh, when, when the, the previous head of department, Jen Potts, um, took up a, 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 a position as a head of school in the uh, School of Life and Environmental Sciences in, in the University of Sydney, which is she's uh, from Australia originally, and so she couldn't uh, pass up the opportunity to go back there and take up that, that position. I knew it was going to be challenging, but I didn't really, <laughs> along with everybody else, I didn't expect what's followed. But it has to be said, it's been um, a, a kind of what, uh, an amazing time in terms of the, the um, seeing the uh, the capacity that people have for uh, for for stepping up to the uh, to the uh, to the occasion, and um, um, one of the things that we've we've um, done rather well, I think, in in biology is we've uh, we've uh, shown a kind of uh, a creativity and innovation and um, willingness to to take part in the civic uh, and take a civic responsibility during the COVID pandemic. So on the on the picture here, this is um, this is somebody called Mark Bentley, who many of you will probably know, who uh, who runs the mechanical workshops in in biology, and here he is donning his um, uh, uh, visor, which uh, which were designed and he he designed these and and made thousands of them in the workshops, um, which were distributed to frontline workers uh, during the uh, during the first lockdown back in 2020. And um, so that's just one of the ways in which we've, we've um, um, pivoted, really, and to do something quite different during during the during the pandemic. 
in other ways we um we donated equipment and and uh, training to to the uh, york hospital so that they could set up the covid testing uh, using uh, qpcr um back last spring and, uh, and in fact york hospital was was the second non non specialist uh, virology unit in the uk to to have pcr testing um which was uh, something we we're very proud of being able to contribute towards and and we continue to be part of the effort so so the um nhs staff across um, york north yorkshire and um, and humberside get their tests via this uh, lamp methodology which which in fact runs out of the um, part of the biology teaching laboratories and there's a certain amount of research going on as well so so some of our immunologists are involved with a uh, with a with a a, a, a large um, collaborative project looking at the immunological consequences of covid infection and the um, in chemistry the structural biology laboratory uh, colleagues who are working on um, covid spike protein But you know, normal things go on as well, and we've we've continued on with uh, with our um, um, <clears throat> with, with educating students and, uh, and and carrying out research. And just to just to touch on a few student stories that uh, that, that um, I've illustrated here. This is just some examples. So at the top we have Evelyn who did a did a placement last year at the um, at the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Uh, and as I go round, perhaps clockwise, there's uh, there's um, Faye who who was um, uh, voted as the uh, campus intern of the year for her work last summer um, on uh, helping the university marketing uh, with um, with their social media uh, strategy. I have uh, B who's uh, down on the uh, sort of the lower lower right hand side here who graduated and is now a a, um, a, a data engineer. So so one of the I think the strengths of what we've been doing over the last several years is to really develop the skills of our students in in uh, data analysis, which is really really um, coming to fruition now as as we um, graduate students who have got this, this great expertise dealing with with large data sets and complex data sets. Uh, Alex is on the bottom left there. He's he's our um, he's our graduate uh, research student uh, rep. He's been pretty busy this year trying to support students who've obviously been going through uh, difficult and turbulent times, particularly um, the, the PhD students and masters by research students who haven't had the access to the labs that they would like or the ability to go and do field work where, where necessary. But, if, um, um, but he's been very supportive for them and I think that the department and the university has actually uh, done, done well by, by our students to, uh, to support them. Um, with extensions and uh, and trying to grant access in as safe uh, a way as we can. So this has varied a little bit over the last 15 months, but um, whether we've had 25% 20, uh, occupancy of the labs or 50% occupancy, it's varied a little bit over time as we've as we've adapted to the, uh, to the prevailing conditions. And then on the left, having his lunch stolen is, is, uh, is Ben, who did his uh, Erasmus um, placement year on uh, in in, um, in, <clears throat> in Denmark. Uh, on the right, uh, should should mention Emma Rand, who many of you all uh, will know, and she she won a uh, prestigious Advance HE National Teaching Fellowship last year for all her uh, work that she's done. I mean, actually, talking of uh, talking of, of B and the, and becoming a data engineer, Emma, of course, has been um, uh, an important force in in supporting our. Um, uh, the development of student quantitative and computational skills over over years now. I thought I'd touch on a few uh, few research highlights. Uh, so so um, we recruited a new new professor uh, last year. This is uh, who's called Matthew Thomas, and Matt's an entomologist who works on malaria. And this is a this is a, um, a, a photograph from a from a workshop that uh, that took place in Cote d'Ivoire. Where some of his research on malaria is based, and uh, and earlier on this year, Matthew um, published a paper in the Lancet on uh, on designing uh, um, housing and interventions to prevent malaria in the in the Cote d'Ivoire. So it's exciting to have Matthew here. He's he's uh, the director of the uh, of Yesi, 
which is the York Environmental Sustainability Institute, as well as being a, a, a professor in the department. Many of you will uh, remember Simon McQueen Mason, who, uh, who works in CNAP, and he's been there, uh, he's uh, has a, a history of developing creative ideas around, uh, around biotechnology. And one of the things that he's been working on recently is uh, thinking about the fabrics industry and how, how that can be made more sustainable. Uh, he's been working with the Royal College of Art in London and, uh, and using um, methods to uh, allow bacteria to re regenerate uh, cellulose from discarded fabrics and agricultural residues. That's uh, shown on the picture here. So there's just a couple of the, um, of, of the uh, interesting and diverse research projects which are going on in the park, which I could possibly go on for hours about different things that people are doing, but I, I, shall, I shall resist that. We have... Uh, uh, said uh, wave goodbye to some some long-standing colleagues over the last uh, last year or so. So uh, Harv Isaacs, Chris Elliott, and, and Debbie Smith, who you can see here, all retired uh, over the last twelve months. And uh, but they're all still very much actively involved with the department in a in honorary uh, or emeritus uh, status. So uh, so we'll still we're still seeing them around, but uh, but they they're no longer um, uh, teaching on the front line. Uh, but they're still very much around the place. I, I, I thought it would be worth putting in an image of, of what the department looks like now. Um, you can, um, it, it, depending on your, uh, when, when you were in York, you may recognise uh, some or all of the, um, of the buildings that are contained on here. So there's the, the core of the department next to the uh, next to the water on the right that's, that's been around since the 60s or 70s. There are various um, buildings and uh, extensions that were um, added on during the 80s and 90s. The um, the, um, uh, uh, the the building to the in the centre at the top there was in the uh, early early 2000s, and then some of the other buildings down the left hand side. Adjacent to the Warm Gate Stray, which are which have been built in the last um, in the last uh, twenty years, um, and um, we're we're looking now again at, uh, at redevelopment of our research labs. So, so I'm not sure uh, how how familiar you are with the size of and scale of the department these days, but we have something like twelve hundred students in the department now, and uh, an academic staff of about eighty, and we're looking to recruit more because we have expanded our, our our student body over the last uh, over the last two or three years so we now take in about 330 undergraduate students a year and uh, and uh, so we're looking to recruit new academic staff and um, and develop um, new spaces for students and staff to to work so we're in, we're in the process of uh, developing plans for modeling some of our modernizing some of the research labs at the moment and uh, perhaps replacing some of the um, some of the oldest parts of the um, of the estate um, and that will be a project for for which will probably take a, a number of years to come to fruition but you know we'll, we'd like to keep you up to date with our progress on that as we as we go through it um one i mean in addition to modernizing the research labs a few of the other um things that we've been talking a lot about recently are around establishing international partnerships for education and research we're particularly keen to be developing um, uh, partnerships uh, with in in africa where we have a lot of research work that goes on and some educational programs that we've been involved with and we'd like to to really um, uh, build on those uh, through through having uh, a um, strong uh, bilateral partnerships with African institutions and uh, and having um, uh, scholarship exchange programs and that sort of thing. Uh, we want to make sure that our graduates have the best possible prospects and and I think this is certainly somewhere where um, alumni can can start to to help us to 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 help students to understand you know what the what the prospects are based on what uh, their, some of their predecessors have done but also to get involved with, um, with um, providing um, opportunities perhaps for, uh, for, for current students to gain some further experience and be, and be really, um, to be able to use their university time as a, as a springboard to their future success. 
And we really want to involve uh, partners to support our students, as I say, um, to inform our curricula and to, and to take part in our activities. And this, this, is, um, this is something where we want to engage with our industrial and uh, other um, research um, collaborator stakeholders, but also very much get your input into you know, what sorts of things ought we to be doing uh, to really best enable our students to make a success of themselves. Uh, outside uh, outside of university. So um, I'll just finish off with a few a few thoughts for you. Um, are there things that you could uh, you could you could help us with? Okay, so students are often looking for placements or summer internships, and this is something we've been really trying to grow our portfolio of um, of, of placements and internships. Um, is that something you could help with potentially? Would you be able to provide an alumnus uh, profile uh, for our web pages to inspire the next generation of graduates? Or, or would you be interested in delivering a talk to students about your career path and show, to show, help us um, showcase that diversity of options that are available to, uh, that are, that are available to students? And um, really, I think something to think about whilst you're listening intently to, to Dave's talk uh, over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is how would you like to engage with us so let us know how how you'd like us to keep in touch with you so is having an occasional event like this on on zoom something that we should keep doing going forward would there be opportunities where you'd like to come and visit the department and and look around would that be something you'd be uh, you'd be keen to do or are there other ways that you'd like us to uh, to facilitate your continued engagement with us um, do you think there's something we should be teaching our students uh, and that perhaps you could help with with um, as we as we um, go through the process of uh, developing our curriculum? And are there are there projects you'd like to get involved with or contribute to? Um, so if, if there's any thoughts on this, we'd like to hear it today. But of course, going forward, contact uh, the uh, um, uh, Steph and Fran in the biology engagement team. There's an email for them at the bottom there. And uh, I'm also, of course, happy to hear from, from anybody uh, directly. So use, uh, use that email address down there, the BioHod email, and, uh, and I'll look forward to hearing your, uh, your ideas and, and queries. So I will, uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'll stop that. Um, and um, um, that's me done and I'll hand over to uh, Dave with uh, for, for, the, for a research talk and then uh, look forward to uh, having some questions from you later on. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks, James. Hopefully everyone can hear me, but please do let us know if you can through the chat. Um, so uh, as James mentioned, of course, there's really exciting research going on uh, across a wide range of biological disciplines. Uh, he's mentioned some great work from Matt Thomas in, in the environment and sustainability side of things, but also uh, from the, the sort of plant sciences side of things uh, as well. And I think this, this talk is really to, to sort of represent uh, our sort of growing uh, student body and our growing research body uh, in the biomedical sciences. And so you, you may not uh, have been in biology at a time when biomedical sciences existed here as a formal program. And now we're taking nearly 100 students a year uh, into the BMS program. Uh, and that's really focused on, on trying to expand our translational and, and healthcare impact uh, by researchers at York. Uh, and so one of the things that I, that I think you may not know as uh, members of the York community is that, that we have growing strengths in infectious diseases for one. Uh, James mentioned the connection uh, on the environment side to malaria, but of course we've got excellent researchers studying neglected tropical diseases uh, with African partners, uh, leishmania, uh, trypanosome biology, really excellent stuff that's nationally recognized. And we've got a real national treasure on the hematology side as well with something called the Hematological Malignancies uh, Research Network, which is, which is a clinical epidemiology network of, of all the hematological disorders, so all the blood cancers uh, that exist in the country. Uh, and it's got one of the largest resources, uh, as I said, uh, in the country that, that really can profile uh, these patients and look for clues to how disease evolves. 
And what I'll talk to you about today is, is somewhat related to that last, uh, that last point around blood cancers and some new technologies really that we've been trying to develop in using the sort of advanced genomic technologies to try and understand how we exist as healthy people from a, from a blood, uh, blood production point of view, but also how this process goes wrong over the course of life and, and how things uh, can become imbalanced. So, so blood stem cells, why, why do we bother caring? Why do we research blood stem cells? Well, the whole field really launched uh, in the 1940s and 50s uh, when uh, we had the dropping of the two atomic bombs at the end of the Second World War. Uh, and, and we very quickly learned as a community that radiation rapidly kills cells and that high exposures to radiation, specifically in this case through the atomic bomb, uh, really drives damage to these cells and can drive the uh, development of diseases such as leukemia. And you can see this in data form in this table that was published some years ago now, uh, where you can see that the exposure areas have between a three and 15 fold increase in leukemia. And leukemia is typically quite a rare disorder, uh, very, very ruthlessly fatal uh, when it does occur, but, but quite rarely. Uh, and, uh, and you can see uh, that if you were within a uh, very close area to the proximity of that bomb drop, you had uh, fairly certain that the risk that you developed that leukemia from that atomic bomb drop was, was very high. Uh, and so, so the closer you were to this radiation exposure, the worse it would be. Uh, and of course, people very uh, rapidly became quite experimental with how they tried to solve this crisis in, in blood cancer development. And it was uh, discovered that you could rescue uh, somebody from this horrible disease. Uh, by uh, having a matched bone marrow transplantation. And this has been the sort of staple stem cell therapy for some decades now, where we try and replace the blood system of somebody who's, who's got a blood system uh, that's, gone, that's gone wrong. And so this is sort of a timeline for how transplantation has existed over the years. Uh, and just to put this up to really highlight the vast array of diseases that if we understood fully how stem cells work, these are the types of diseases that we'd be able to treat because they're either derived from stem cells or will be uh, treatable by products made from stem cells. Uh, so everything from radiation exposure all the way through to cancer development, uh, immune disorders, uh, and perhaps most excitingly, in, in recent years, uh, this real push towards genetic therapy. So, so gene therapy, where you go in and correct uh, a, a disorder uh, genetically and reinfuse back the patient's corrected cells uh, to, to fix that disorder. So uh, the blood stem cell system and the blood system in general has been historically quite, uh, quite a well-studied system because of its easy access. Uh, so, so getting blood samples from patients throughout the course of a disorder or a disease is, is quite easy and, and quite reasonably uh, accessible. And this allows us to really have quite an incredible amount of information around um, how we uh, understand cancers that we suspect have derived from those single blood stem cells, but also to harness that power of blood stem cells and their, their natural sort of ability to create all of the blood cells in our body. And, and this is trillions of blood cells per day. So we're not talking about something tiny, but, but a real scale here. And if we could control that outside the body, you could start to imagine things like replacing the need for blood cell donation or marrow donation uh, and having uh, cells in banks and freezers that could treat leukemia, anemia, HIV, AIDS, et cetera but also from a sort of more medically adventurous uh, point of view, we can use blood stem cells as the base product for a huge array of cell therapies and in particular uh, gene therapies. So fundamentally, I guess we have to think about stem cells on a single cell level, right? So what are, what are they actually doing? How do they work? Uh, and we, we often simplify this into stem cells at a population level need to create one copy of themselves to, to be that seed cell that produces all of the blood cells, but also it needs to produce the specialized cells of the blood system where it goes off and makes say a T cell to fight disease or a red blood cell to cause oxygen or to carry oxygen around the body. And of course, this exists at a population balance uh, pretty much right in the middle. If you came back tomorrow at the same time, you'd have more or less the same number of blood stem cells, the same number of blood cells uh, across your, your whole body. And so there's an incredible production and destruction done on a daily basis. And the problem becomes when this balance gets disturbed. And so it's no longer producing and destroying equal numbers of cells or the same types of cells. 
Uh, and if you have too few stem cells, you end up uh, having aging and degeneration. So you can get bone marrow failure late in life or, or low numbers of particular cells that help you fight diseases, for example. And if you have an accumulation of too many stem cells, then you're no longer producing the correct numbers of cells to do the normal jobs of the body, like fight off disease or carry oxygen around the body. And so this is a situation where you have that accumulation of immature cell types that results in cancer. So we really focus our research efforts on trying to understand how this balance is established and maintained and what the implications of disturbances in these balances are uh, for disease development. Now, one of the things that we don't often think about uh, is um, these sorts of fundamental issues uh, with how we do science. Uh, and, and I'd like people to imagine you have two handfuls of sand. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that in one of those handfuls, I've placed a seed that can grow a plant. And, and I say, okay, well, what are the properties of that seed? And you say, well, that's gonna be very hard to find out because I've got a handful of sand here, I can't even see the seed. So the biologist in you says, okay, well, how about I do a test and find out where the seed is? So you take that handful of sand and you whack it in the ground and you find out, oh, I've had a, I've had a plant grow. And so you know that in the second hand, you had the seed at some point. And, and I've put down HSC here, that's the term we use for hematopoietic stem cell. So a blood stem cell. So you know you had a blood stem cell here. But the problem is now you've got this plant. And so you can no longer study the seed that created the plant and so you still can't find out what the, what the molecular nature is of that cell. And, and this is the fundamental problem with stem cell biology is that we are always after the molecules that are driving the decision-making in a cell that we can't study because in order to know it was there, we had to grow a plant out of it or grow a blood system. And so how do we get back to that cell? How do we understand or link the molecules in a cell before we have to assay it? Uh, and so this, this is a, a, a real problem of retrospective assays. Now, we've been uh, involved in quite a number of studies uh, to really try and push at new tools to help us address this issue of how do we track blood stem cells before we know that they're actually blood stem cells. And I won't talk about a lot of this stuff, but to say we're, we're really focused on pioneering single cell molecular techniques uh, to try and link functional assays where we transplant in blood stem cells uh, and ask what can they do, and then we link them to the molecular assays that tell us what molecules are driving it. Uh, but what I will spend some time talking to you about today is, is harnessing the power of whole genome sequencing to really allow us to see uh, a sort of natural occurring uh, genetic barcode. And that, that barcode will allow us to track stem cells in an unperturbed fashion uh, over the course of a, of a human's individual life. And the very basic premise is this. You can imagine that we all originally started from a single cell, right? This sperm and egg come together, create that, that single zygote that, that contains that master genome that we all started from. And as our cells divide, and there's you know, 6 billion different bases of DNA that, that we have in that original single cell, as our cells divide, we accumulate these neutral mutations through a various number of biological processes, but they accumulate at roughly a linear rate. And so we can, we can use the fact that these mutations are occurring. And so you just simply modify by, or represented by an X and a square here. As we go down through each successive cell division, you get these natural marks of which cell was related to which other cell. And you can reconstruct backwards who's related to who. So who's cousin of who and who's a grandfather of who, et cetera, from a, from a cell by cell point of view. And this is what it looks like if you do this in a person. So you can imagine that you've got each of these circles represents an individual cell that you can pull out of a person uh, at, at the sort of age, in this case, this is a 60 year old individual. And you can do the whole genome, uh, sequence all of those bases across that whole genome and reconstruct the phylogenetic tree. So the family tree of how these stem cells are really related to each other. So you've got trillions of cells in a, in a given person, but every single cell has a, a very slightly different genome. And you can, like I said, reconstruct where they've come from based on that genome. Now, the really exciting thing for us is that when I started my training uh, a long time ago, uh, this experiment to create these 150 or so genomes would have cost us 7 billion pounds. And so we wouldn't have done it because uh, that, that's quite un undoable. Uh, in 2010, so a decade later, the genomic technologies had advanced to the point where this would have cost us about 150 million pounds. 
And today, or uh, last year, by the time this number was calculated, uh, we would do this experiment for 30,000 pounds. And that's a much more achievable number, something we can actually afford to do in a laboratory setting. And that represents that sort of number about 200 to 500 pounds per genome. Uh, and, and that's something that really makes this sort of personalized medicine type approach really tractable now, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago, it would, it would have driven the NHS bankrupt. And so this is something that is definitely in the cards for the next sort of 5, 10, 15 years, where you'll be seeing a lot more genetic sequencing of tumors, genetic sequencing of individuals to, to really inform healthcare decisions. Now, how we use this uh, to try and understand blood cell production uh, is, is in this manner. Uh, so the place where blood stem cells live in your body is the bone marrow. Uh, this is the sort of soft, squishy stuff that's inside of your bones. And we can extract from there individual single blood stem cells and grow them up outside the body to create enough DNA that we can do this whole genome sequencing. And then, like I said, we reconstruct this family tree. And so we sort of say mutations are present and we can, we can go backwards and reconstruct that family tree. And we did this in a paper a couple of years ago now. Uh, and what we found uh, is, that, is that you can really track the number of mutations per cell. Like I said, this is an, an individual who's 60 years old. So the number of mutations per cell that are derived from that original sperm and egg genome is roughly 1,100 per individual cell. And it's roughly constant across the, the total number of cells in an individual's body. And so every single cell in your body has accrued that sort of 1,100 mutations over those six decades. And those mutations aren't bad for you. They don't change the function necessarily uh, of your cells and, and they're coexisting, but, but uniquely marking uh, the cells so we can track them over time. And this sort of technique allows us to count stem cells using a, a suite of uh, evolutionary biology tools that are, that are usually used to track how species grow over the course of time and allows us to track those individual stem cells in an individual person over time as well because we can now use genetic techniques to go in and look for descendants of each of these branches of the family tree uh, later in life. And so we can go back into the same individual five years, 10 years later and ask, are certain stem cells producing more cells or fewer cells than we anticipated? Uh, and this really gives us a complete understanding of every single cell and the mutations that are present in those cells. And you can imagine if this person ever developed a, a cancer, we'd be able to track it back and have its full origins in this, in this blood system. Uh, and so that, that would be quite a, a, a development to be able to study. But of course, we want to start asking that question a little more formally and a little sooner. Uh, so, so what about blood cancers in people? And so how do we study this in, in situations where we have, say, the overproduction of blood cells, uh, such as these pre-leukemic disorders called the myeloproliferative diseases, or in stress hematopoiesis, where actually the, the pressure is on the stem cells to produce more and more cells because the body is genetically uh, sort of failing to produce those cells. So, so a set of inherited diseases called bone marrow failure syndromes. But underpinning all of this is the, is the fundamental question of how do single stem cells grow into a pot of cells that outcompetes every other blood cell in your body to drive a cancer. So one cell is the, the sort of target that drives a cancer and, and corrupts the whole blood system. And so we have elected in this particular case to try and hone in on a disorder called Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. And this is a rare inherited childhood disease, but we've carefully selected it because it's a bone marrow failure disorder where there's an extreme pressure on the stem cells to overproduce cells because they're so poor at developing them. And these children uh, have skeletal defects, poor growth on average, uh, and about 30% of them will develop leukemia. So the, the sort of mission overall here is to identify what are the genetic changes that drive these leukemias? How do they grow over time? How do they compete against the other normal cells uh, in, in a person's uh, body? And so this is that same sort of family tree approach. Uh, excuse all of the, the sort of code that we use that uh, should have made a better slide here, uh, but basically pretend these are circles on the bottom. Uh, and this is this one of these individuals with uh, Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. And I'll draw your attention to a few things that we can learn by this sort of uh, tree building exercise. The first is that we can see in this one individual multiple independent events happening in multiple independent stem cells that are driving 
a rescue of the bone marrow failure, but also uh, is sort of imposing a, a fairly hefty mutational burden in that, in that cell. And so for those who've studied biology over the years, you'll probably recognize P53 as the sort of guardian of the genome. This is a major uh, gene that if mutated drives cancers uh, in, in pretty much any solid or liquid cancer. Uh, but we also have a number of mutations in, in uh, EIF6, which is a ribosomal gene, uh, and several other ribosomal protein mutations. And this is because the original mutation that drives Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome is involved in, in the production of ribosomes. And so these are direct rescues of, of that initial defect. And so, so that's what they're, they're doing. And so the, the sort of question becomes, you know, is it, is it better to have your stem cell rescued with a ribosomal mutation or with a P53 mutation? Uh, the second thing, and, and the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed this, this is quite odd that all of these cells here are derived from this big long branch with a, a, which, with a large number of shared mutations. And so this suggests to us that the, the stem cell that created this branch is heavily overrepresented in this patient. And so about 20% of the total cells in the patient are derived from that, that sort of single stem cell that would have existed, say, when the individual was two or three years of age. And, and that clonal expansion, uh, we have looked exhaustively uh, through this set of mutations to try and find a, a, a particular mutation that makes sense for driving it. Because of course, this would be very interesting to know if, if this is the one that's driving uh, the disease rescue, is it a good rescue or a bad rescue? And the bad version being the one that will eventually drive a leukemia, the good one rescuing the bone marrow failure without driving that leukemia. And so, so this is a sort of a study underway right now to try and figure out what those mutations are. But of course, we haven't just studied one patient. We've gone in now and, and cataloged several patients, uh, sort of, uh, I think we're at 10 now. Uh, and these are, like I said, they're not, they're not cheap experiments, so you can't do it in thousands of patients. Uh, but we can see this same pattern of multiple independent acquisitions, and all of the mutations are happening in single stem cells, and they're competing against each other over time. And these are really interesting things to follow up in these longitudinal studies where we go in and get new samples from the patient and ask which which clones, which stem cell pots are contributing more versus less, which ones are more likely to drive a leukemia, which ones are more likely to be safe for the patient to have. And that sort of prompts our ability to be able to design specific targeted therapies to go after those mutations and promote the good ones and pull back on the bad ones. And, and you can do that now with, with a, a sort of advanced chemistry uh, and small molecule development. Uh, one of the interesting things, I mentioned P53 earlier because it's such a well-known cancer gene, is that single copy loss of TP53, so that, that's losing one of your two copies from your mom or your dad, uh, doesn't actually associate with genome-wide mutation accumulation. And so there's not an increased number of mutations having this, this sort of guardian of the genome removed. And so this tells us for the first time in a direct way that you have to lose two copies to have the genetic damage that's imposed by P53. And so one copy isn't so bad. It sort of primes you for loss of the second copy, which would be bad, but actually you can live with P53 mutations for decades and have no genetic consequences for it. And this is actually something that's uh, mirrored in skin as well, where people have done sequencing in, in eyelid skin and shown the same thing where they see P53 mutations, but no overt disease. And so this really challenges the cancer community to reevaluate how it, how it thinks about P53. And so the summary here, I guess, is that multiple independent mutations can rescue these stem cell clones from their bone marrow failure, but these will compete differently over the course of time. Uh, and that P53 mutations are perhaps not as dangerous as single copy losses, uh, but in cases where both copies are lost, it, it's incredibly uh, bad to have. Uh, and then finally, I thought I'd leave it with a, a sort of where do we go from here? And one of our big collaborations right now is not just to study how these uh, cells compete over time, but we're also trying to explore new areas uh, in gene therapy. And we're working with partners at Great Ormond Street and Boston Children's Hospital uh, in a gene therapy trial that they already have going on to treat sickle cell anemia. And we're trying to figure out using this approach, how many stem cells can actually be targeted uh, for that gene therapy and how do they compete over time in, in an effort to try and understand what the leukemia risk is for these patients because gene therapy trials have historically been uh, linked to leukemia development 
and also uh, to understand how they compete over time so we get a better graft that can actually cure the disease more rapidly. Uh, and so those are ongoing studies now funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and with that, I'll just leave, uh, leave us open for questions, so to speak. Uh, and, and on that slide uh, of, of key people that have been really driving this, we work with a series of clinician scientists down in Cambridge, so Peter Campbell and Alan Warren. Peter's the head of the Cancer Genome Project at the Sanger Institute and has been instrumental in being able to achieve these sorts of scales of genomic technology development. Uh, we've got people in York uh, and, and key collaborators, like I said, uh, uh, Cambridge, UCL, Great Ormond Street, uh, and Harvard University. And of course, our funders are, are absolutely critical to all of this research. And as I said, uh, York is really trying to push and develop its biomedical science uh, research community. And, and this, is, this has been one of those studies that, that will hopefully stimulate some of that activity. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions you might have.